My name is Jane Bernard. I'm the founder of Wagworthy Naturals. We make healthy natural supplements for dogs. I'm located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, I'm very engaged in rescue. We donate a percentage of our proceeds to senior dog rescue and to, <clears throat> excuse me, subsidize spay neuter programs. Um, and I think Dr. Marty doesn't need a huge introduction, but I've got some things I wanna share. Um, as you know, he's a renowned integrative vet and he pioneered, was one of the pioneers of combining, combining conventional and alternative treatments. He's also a founding member of the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association and he founded Smith Ridge Veterinary Center in South Salem, New York, which is also the focus of a recent documentary that if you haven't seen, I highly recommend and you can stream it now. It's called The Dog Doc. Um, and it was made by the um, folks that did Buck, which I bet many of you have already seen. He's also um, an author. Uh, he wrote a book called The Nature of Animal Healing, The Definitive Holistic Guide to Caring for Your Dog and Cat, which he's in the process of updating. And you can pre-order it on Amazon. He also hosted his own weekly program called Ask Martha's Vet with Dr. Marty on Martha Stewart Serious Radio. Plus he's been, you know, on Oprah and the Martha Show and Good Morning America. And he, you know, uh, has a lot to share with us about healing. So welcome, Dr. Marty. I'm really thrilled to have you join us on this kind of old home week here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the documentary is really a trip. The way the, you know, they didn't capture what I thought I wanted them to capture because, really? you know, when, when you take a case on, you don't know how that case is going to turn out. Right. And they always started at the beginning of a case and in the humdrum of how crazy and intense Smith Ridge is, you can't really put a lot of focus on filming and mm -hmm. getting content. You're concerned about the 30 animals that are terminal right. in your hospital every day. That's your focus. And so, you know, over three years, we, we gathered 300 hours. Uh, and a, then vid a video for the film. A video. Mm -hmm. And then the editor who did it, the edited Buck, did an amazing job. To, I, I was actually afraid to watch it the first time. It was going to be, oh, no, this is not me and this and that. I've already seen it like 23 times. That's pretty good. And, you know, because every time I went to a film festival, or it was online, you know, even though I was obligated to come in at the end to do the Q and A, I always came in at the beginning and I get goosebumps and tears every time I watch this documentary because it's, you know, it's not me. It's, it's when the truth comes out, you know, there was, there was happy tears and there are very sad tears. And, you know, the tears that come with joy, that something is really, really good it's just a very rewarding feeling. And that's what this documentary is. I so just love it. So when you said it's not you, you mean what's coming through is the healing and the animals? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, when you get to see the stories, when you get to see that what you believed in going back 45 years ago, that got arrows and criticism and legal threats and, you know, everything you could imagine. And then all of a sudden you see it come forward 45 years to a level of acceptance and then to a level of what this documentary portrays that's now going out nationally. You just get this overwhelmingly warm feeling that, ah, you know, COVID will end. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, because that's your life's work, you know. And yeah, it's my it life's is, work. You put a lot of time and effort and sweat and tears and challenges. And I'm sure there were many, you know, failures that you, things that you thought might work that didn't work and then you refined and it's beautiful that it's, get, you know, it, it's that there's this tribute to your work in this film. So as I said, it is available for streaming now. So please, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do so. Um, can you share a little bit about your philosophy and your approach in how you treat animals yeah you know i graduated cornell in 1973 and one time i was number two in my class which was shocking to everyone including <laughs> my family and me 
And pro approximately one out of 10 dogs got cancer in those days. Uh -huh. And it was always a disease of the old. So if we saw a young dog with a lump, we eliminated the possibility of cancer based solely on age. Now, recent statistics say one out of every 1.61 dogs in the United States will get cancer. And it's prominently also a disease of the young. So there's really something wrong with the entire view of health from the medical establishment. There is no health care. It's a disease-oriented establishment. We learn how to diagnose disease and drug it, but we also have learned how to try to prevent disease using agents that cause more disease than what they're trying to prevent. And so, so, so this is also what makes you controversial among the established um, veterinary circles. Yeah, except for one thing. I have on my side someone that in the end result, in the long run, surpasses all of that. And her name is Mother Nature. <laughs> and I don't care how much medical technology you have. There is nothing as strong or knowledgeable as Mother Nature. As technologically advanced as we become, we cannot build a body that could heal the cut. Nature did that. Now, my definition of medicine and science is that science in the field of medicine is man trying to figure out what nature already laid down. So I'm so impressed by how technologically advanced we've become where we've learned the metabolic pathways, the oxygenation pathways. We could do a CAT scan with dye studies and go down to each single nerve and stuff like that. But we're studying what nature created. So when nature creates a disease or a symptom, scientific man has learned how to stop that with a chemical. And what happens when you go against nature? You lose. And going against nature in the field of medicine, you know what that's called? Tell us. Cancer. Ah. It's not more complicated than that. Cancer is not a natural disease. A disease that it was created by man's adulteration and aberration of natural law. End of story, period. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, moving right along. And for the on, listeners then. here, I'm going to give them a little insight. I didn't, I'm not updating my first book. Oh, okay. I Excuse me, I misspoke. Yeah, I wrote book two. Okay. Book one was The Nature of Animal Healing that I wrote over 20 years ago, and it's still in the top 10,000 out of 9 million on Amazon. And in the title, nature had two meanings. The, the nature in way the body heals, but also that nature is the healing. The title of the second book is called The Spirit of Animal Healing. Okay. And spirit also has two definitions. One is in the spirit of healing, but also the spiritual connection when it comes to healing between the human race and the animal race. And in there, and I'm going to give you a little insight to the book. One of my favorite, maybe my most favorite book of all time is Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. Not so much, even though I at one time was going to become a paleontologist because I love dinosaurs. I used to study dinosaurs like crazy. But Michael Crichton, in the, in the book Jurassic Park, the philosophy and theories he lays down in that book, especially through the doctor, Dr. Malcolm, is beyond anything. I quoted Jurassic Park in my first book, and then I quoted Jurassic Park again in this book. And if you ever read Jurassic Park, you'll see that at the beginning of each major section in the book, he lays down a Venn diagram at the beginning of the section, and he calls them iterations. 
And the first iteration was like 20 little squares together. And then when you get to the next section of the book, there's like 47 different squares starting to go out of whack. And when you get to the sixth and seventh iteration, there are squares all over the place. And he's referencing that to control. And his theory in Jurassic Park is that it had to fail. When you bring back on the earth animals that lived 500 million years ago, you are going against natural law so much that it had to fail. It wasn't Newman from Seinfeld in the movie leaving the gate unlatched. If he didn't do that, something had to give. And cancer is identical to that. When you go against nature so much by bombarding the body with vaccines, 10 times what a great day needs, given to the chihuahua every single year, putting flea retardant chemicals in there, putting them on a diet, that is cereal based, you've gone against natural law so strong, cancer had to become what it is. It's not a mysterious thing that just attacked the body. And you know what, and I'm, I'm in the final copy editing stage, even though the book is now out on Amazon and it's ranked number one in veterinary medicine, but it's not getting released till next February 2nd, and I'm still editing, I am adding a footnote in that section because there's no difference also between his analogy and COVID, oh, period. Interesting. So bringing it back to treatments, how do you see, because I know you're not anti-vax, although you don't, you're careful not to over-vaccinate, um, how do, can, could, and you do use many conventional modalities in your practice, how do you see conventional and holistic treatments complementing one another? Well, unfortunately, right now, I mean, if you just look at cancer again, cancer is an immune deficiency or immune suppressed disease. It's not a condition it's not an entity that lives in the environment that attacks the body. It doesn't live in the garage and all of a sudden, boom, it hits your dog. It's normal cells that go haywire because the immune system is not working. So we have to look at the things that suppress cancer. Chemotherapy and radiation are two of the most immunosuppressive agents we've ever, ever created. That is well known. The link between the radiation causes can causing cancer and cancer is huge. So in the healthcare profession, we've gotten to a point in modern science where we're using two of the most immune suppressive agents to treat a condition caused by immune suppression. That's called an oxymoron. That's how much we've screwed up healthcare, but we've screwed it up so much that if we don't use radiation or chemotherapy on a patient, they will die. Right, San Diego? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's unfortunate. Yeah, but so talk about within your practice how you combine holistic and conventional to treat. Well, we do it case by case. Okay. And it's, you know, one of the things, when, when I first became a holistic veterinarian, my pendulum swung so much in the other way that I thought all medicine was bad. And I wasn't as successful as a practitioner as I became realizing that if you don't put this dog on a drug, it's going to die. If you don't do surgery on this dog to remove a tumor, it's going to die. If you don't send this dog with lymphoma 
to an oncologist to do radiation, it's going to die. So it's a balancing act of using conventional and alternative. I mean, one of the advantages we've had in the overview is so many of the cases we've seen over three or four decades already failed conventional therapy at the highest level. They came from the institutions. They came from the specialty. In your clinic. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we didn't have to go to conventional medicine because they came dying on it conventional because medicine. Because conventional medicine didn't work for them. Right. And then we put them on supplements and homeopathic remedies, and they got better and dietary changes. And it's these cases that I've documented that when I now lecture to the veterinary schools, blows them away because they're documented. I have the medical records. You know, I have the thirteen to eighteen thousand dollars worth of medical therapy. I have photographs of the animal when they came into our practice. I have the stopping of the drugs. I show the programs that we put them on, and then I show them running around six years later. And so, so what are some of those techniques, or what are some of those holistic modalities that you you, you said supplements? Yeah, yeah, supplements and nutraceuticals, uh -huh. remedies acupuncture, intravenous vitamin C, which you saw big time mm -hmm. in the documentary. Do you realize right now, and everyone that's listening could go online and research the most effective treatment for COVID in China is intravenous vitamin C. If you go into the NIH, the National Institute of Health, you will see scientific documentation on how effective high doses of intravenous vitamin C is against killing the COVID virus. How come you don't hear our president say that? Well. Or our president's, president's scientists, who we really you know, respect. There are doctors right now in New York, in human hospitals, that are successfully using intravenous vitamin C at doses way below what, what they should be doing and becoming successful in turning around COVID patients. So this is, you know, this to me is my focus in life. Not, not condition, not therapies that I've created because I'm not a researcher, but to serve as a, a spokesperson to actually take things that are now scientific documented and just slam them in the face of the public and the profession and say, wake up, hey, wake up. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for uh, speaking for myself and I'm guessing everyone else on this call feels the same way, you know, every day that I get to spend with my dog is precious. So I work to do, you know, I exercise him, I give him quality food, um, I'm conscientious about what he eats and how I take care of him. And I do, uh, my vet is a integrative vet. I see um, Dr. Holly Johnson, who is in Taos, New Mexico. I'm in Santa Fe for anyone that came on a little later. Um, but for those of us, you know, who feel this way about our dogs and want to do everything we can to really take great care of them to prevent illness and cancer down the road, what are some recommendations that we can do just in our day-to-day -day living? And well, the number one recommendation by far anywhere in the United States is hook yourself up with an integrative veterinarian. Don't hook yourself up with Dr. Google, period. Even though it's a wealth of knowledge, it leads to so much confusion and we just don't know. So the number one, the number one piece of advice is hook yourself up with an integrative veterinarian. The AHVMA, American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, .org, has a listing of all the integrative veterinarians in the United States, state by state, city by city, and the modalities they practice. That's the number one. Number two, Read my, read my first book. Read, <laughs> the reason it's still a top seller and in the top 10,000 out of 9 million is the book is about nature and common sense. 
not about me. And those things will never change. Healing won't change. Science is going to change. Technology is going to change. Healing's not going to change. Medicine's not going to change. On the alternative, herbs are not going to change. Acupuncture is not going to change. But new chemotherapeutics are going to come out. New, you know, fangled radiation therapies are going to come out. They're all very unnatural. So read the book. Don't be afraid to use common sense and actually try to assign a purpose to why nature is creating a condition. A fever is not an aspirin deficiency. An inflammation is not a cortisone deficiency. There are purposes and reasons they're happening. Not that, and this is where you need a good integrated veterinarian. Some of the greatest cases I've ever turned around ran a fever of 106 and a half to 107 before their cancer went away. And I didn't drug that fever. So, you know, it's tough as a layperson with a pet to make that call. Working with a very good integrated veterinarian will help you out. Mm -hmm. And what about, you know, diet and um, what what kind of things can we do? Just, I know it's great to find an integrated veterinarian, but I know also I have people that follow me that are, have very modest means. They can certainly buy your book and read it, but what are some, like, you know, you talked about the flea and tick, so looking for alternative? Oh yeah, absolutely. If the pet food industry was created by scientists that studied the way a dog or a cat ate in the wild, we would have never created the pet food industry. 50 to 64% of most of, of most of the most prominent foods on the market have been cereal and corn based. Right. How much, have you ever seen a dog stalk an ear of corn? <laughs> Martha let me say that the first time she had me on her show. When I put, the, I put the formula up from the, the biggest selling dog food on the planet. The name of the food wasn't there, so she didn't get sued. And corn was the number one ingredient. And her, you know, all her legal people in the script allowed me to turn to Martha and said, Martha, have you ever seen a dog stalk an ear of corn? <laughs> well, you know, I will say that um, my dog does pull the uh, corn cobs out of our um, uh, out of our compost bin, and he'll gnaw on them. I mean, oh, yeah. kernels of corn on them, but he will chew on them. And coyotes will eat anything. Yeah, I'll I'll pull the crust of a of a, a pizza <laughs> out of you know when it's going into the compost thing and, and munch on it because it, it it's good. Yeah, but. I won't live on pizza crust the rest of my life. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so um, one thing I want to ask you and kind of push back a little bit is, you know, you said one out of every 1.6 dogs will get cancer. To be honest, I've had, you know, many dogs in my life and friends of mine have had many dogs in my life. And now maybe it's just because I live in Santa Fe but none of them have actually gotten cancer. And maybe that's because of how, that's how we take care of them. But where did that statistic come from? There, well, first of all, the Morris Animal Foundation, okay. <clears throat> which was originally, you know, not founded, but really spearheaded by Betty White. Mm -hmm. You know, th they've done the study on the golden retrievers. Right. And they're saying right now, as of about a year ago, that in the 1970s, the life expectancy of a golden was 16 to 17. Now it's nine to 10. And 60% up to 66% of the males now get cancer. So that's, that were participated in this study from- Yeah, over 3,000 dogs. Yeah, I, I, I've looked at that study. So yeah. that's specific to goldens, that's yeah. not- but there's, a, there's a, an awesome lady 
uh, with a French name, Beauchat, B-E-A, I, I just put her in my book, that has a graph and has been studying mammalian physiology. And she has a, a chart and graph that I just added into my book, and we got her permission to put it in, that shows the incidence of cancers in the mammalian species. And they're all, all over here and here and here. And all of a sudden, when you start to reach the different breeds of dogs, from 33% up to 60%, all the breeds of dogs are up there. So it's the dog kingdom that's up here. And is that, is that breed specific? In other words, purebreds? Well, yeah, she did it with purebreds, but uh -huh. we see so many. It does, you know, right now, it, it really doesn't make a difference anymore. And but, did, did you feel like you saw that in your own patients? Uh, oh, God, we saw three to five new cases of cancer a day. Well, of course, people were coming to you specifically for that. Right. So that, and... But still, yeah. you know, after you're a veterinarian almost a half century, and, and the reason I was number two for a while is I had a photographic memory, and uh -huh. I still have a very good memory. And when you remember over almost 50 years and you remember the trends and you develop a practice that becomes national. Smith Ridge is one of the only practices in the United States that's nationally based. So if you had a seriously ill animal anywhere in the United States, you'd most likely be referred to one of the local veterinary colleges or big specialty facilities. Right. Right. Smith Ridge was an anomaly. We did a, a survey over a six week period, years back. My average client over six weeks was 590 miles away from Smith Ridge. Oh, average. So people travel because right. you were doing right. special. So you get to see in your mind over that period not only trends decade to decade, but national trends. Right. And I re that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. That's why I had to get out of clinical practice because when I was at Smith Ridge and I worked 12, 14, 18 hours a day, I maybe, if I was lucky, got to eight patients a day. So for every eight patients I saw, 20 to 80,000 were dying. Mm -hmm. And it was really frustrating. You know, the first 20, 30 years, it was great. But after a while, it gets to a point where when you know you can make educationally such a huge impact, why are you staying in a room trying to educate one person about one animal? Some of the, some of the cases are so intense and so near death that it, to save that one patient's life, I would have to put 30 or 40 hours in over yeah. a three week period. Because you were seeing very uh, sick animals. Very, very sick. So yeah. it got to a point where it became so frustrating for me, knowing that I could make an impingement. You know, there's 190 million registered dogs and cats in the United States. Well, it's just a different time in your career. You put in the work and then it was time to do something different. Correct. Yeah. And when you saw, and, and as you see in the documentary, Smithridge is still Smithridge. Yeah. So it's not I dumped it. It's doing exactly what I trained them. Built, yeah. And what, yeah, and what I built. So I'm going to bring this back to um, us as individual dog owners, you know, in terms of um, what, you know, what kind of things, I know that for any dog that gets cancer, that early detection it makes such a huge difference in the ability I to treat the issue. Disagree. You disagree? Yep. And why do you disagree? Because early detection, you're already 90% of the animal's lifetime behind. Okay, so right. if- So if a dog gets hemangiosarcoma. Right, well that's a very, Right. Thing to treat. And if you luck out, let's say the dog comes in and vomits and you do a sonogram 
and you happen to find a one centimeter mass in the spleen, that big, has nothing to do with the vomiting. Right. And you go in surgically and you remove that spleen, no matter what, that dog has three to six months to live. Hmm. So early, so you're already eight years behind. So if we're eight years behind, I know you said find an integrative veterinarian, but what, like, we should have a philosophy about how we raise our dogs, how we take care of our dogs. Yes. Give us a little bit, can you give us yeah. a little bit more beta and a little bit more info? Because I know, you know, people are really interested in that. Yeah. You never do anything to prevent cancer. Okay. So you promote health. Yeah. You, because you don't put that word and that energetic vibration into your universe. So many people have asked me over the years, you know, because we use some great supplements that actually have anti-cancer effects, mm -hmm. artemisinin, poly-MVA, this and that. And they say, do you take that to prevent cancer? And I would go, what's cancer? No, you do things to promote health. You don't do things to prevent disease. So your whole philosophy and what I'm really trying to bring forth and one of the beauties about Smith Ridge is that when you turn a hopeless case around that comes in with a week to live dying of cancer, and then six years later, you're, they're running around using all your modalities and diets and supplements. Imagine if you started that eight years ago when they were a puppy. So the focus right now is not on disease, and how to properly treat disease. It's on establishing and maintaining wellness and health. That's your only health, your only focus should be, let, let me do something healthy for my pet. Dietary, supplement, blah, blah, blah. Don't, I'm not gonna try to prevent cancer. Who cares about cancer? Let's change the word, because the word cancer alone suppresses the immune system. Interesting. If I told you you had cancer, if I mentioned the word cancer and I was your doctor, the good chance you'd develop cancer just from fear. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Vardy. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to open it up. questions. So if the gelatis. Go ahead and either unmute yourself or you can raise your hand. And I see um, there's a comment here from Santiago. The pug, oh, yeah. to everyone. All four of our pugs from different families have cancer. We lost Finn to oral melanoma last month after two years. Yeah. Yeah. Our condolences. One point. That verifies my 1.61 statistic. All four. And Mrs. Santiago is real sharp in healthcare. I've. And you saw a dog in the documentary that I did cryosurgery of its paw. Right. That dog was three months old when it came to me, and 80% of the pad on its paw was already eaten by cancer, and it spread to the dog's lymph node. Dog was three months old. Wow. It's not because it was vaccinated or ate poorly. It was born with the predisposition to rapidly form cancer. Uh -huh. So the reason... Her four of her dogs have cancer, substantiates the statistic I gave you. The gene pool and the entire establishment of the domesticated animal population is in horrible shape right now. Period. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, were you, you're unmuted here. Did you have a question? Uh, no, I just, uh, I just wanted Marty to be able to communicate with us if he needed to. <laughs> <laughs> Not that thing sitting on your right. What do you, give me a break. <laughs> you know what? Dr. Marty is with us for many, many, many years. And it's not for him and love and knowledge and genius for animals. If he wasn't a dog mm -hmm. or an animal, mm -hmm. Our dogs would be gone a long time before. Yeah, let's talk about Dexter. 
Okay. Dexter is the perfect example of the foundation of integrative medicine. Dexter Chihuahua uh, with the typical Chihuahua chronic valvular heart disease. We started on a program and then he went into total congestive heart failure, like real bad heart failure. And you, you were using our cardiologist, mm -hmm. you were in New York City, and didn't they call you in for last rites? Uh, but he has about maybe one or two months left. Right. And, and we started on intense nutraceuticals. We did not stop the drugs because the drugs were needed. But all of those drugs have severe side effects. So when we used all the supplements, we minimized the amount of drugs. So Dexter, in severe heart failure, having maybe a month to live, how long did he live? He, we saw you when he was around six. He lived till 17 and a half. Yeah, hello. <laughs> and, and in x-ray, his heart was bigger than his whole body. <laughs> Still going, going. Right. And it just shows you, Dexter is one of the trips I've seen, and I've seen many. And, you know, you could hear his heart murmur from across the room. You didn't need a stethoscope. <laughs> and he lived most of his life. Quality life. Quality yeah. life, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pain in the ass. Total pain <laughs> in the ass, that dog. He was horrible to get near. <laughs> He was not a nice, he was not a nice guy. That's, That's right. Was amazing. <laughs> but it, it, it's he just was a- the only vet that he loved. Yeah. He let you but it, it's a tribute to integrative medicine. It's a tribute to hope. And it's a tribute to not buying into, oh my God, he's suffering. You have to put him to sleep. Because he should have been put to sleep that day that the cardiologist pronounced him as in total heart failure. And that's what I'm trying to bring across, not false hope, but the fact that there is hope and nature has an ability to not only heal, but to maintain quality of life in the worst conditions. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, Very interesting. Yeah. One more thing, if I may add, is that, is that you really have to believe in it and believe in the doctor, you know, because it really works. It's amazing. Yeah, and, that, and that's, and, and see, that's part of, of this. Gave us hope. Yeah, that's part of the spirit of animal healing that I'm writing about now. Because if you ascend from the physical, I mean, you loved his little physical body. And, you know, he liked your body and this and that. But, you know, we know on a level of spirit and consciousness, you know, especially dogs. Dogs know if you're going to have a seizure 24 hours before the seizure. They know if the hurricane's going to hit. All the animals split when a hurricane's going to hit. So there are levels of existence that are extra physical outside of this realm. Medicine is mundane and only focuses on the physical and the five senses. There are 53 to 56 perceptions in the physical universe. Man only has five. They could taste things, they could smell things, they could see things, they could, you know, blah, blah, blah. So when you start to go on the higher level, and like you hit it, you know, the hope, the relationship with the veterinarian, the relationship with Dexter, all of those things, a very powerful level of healing can occur without the remedy, without the diagnosis. How does a body heal a cut? It doesn't need a diagnosis. It doesn't need a remedy. So, you know, the whole focus of my next book is on the higher level and a wake up call to the profession. Because once you get the ego of a doctor's degree, you become very mundane in science and you close out nature. I've been so criticized by science over my, my career. And they, don't, they just don't get it. 
They don't believe in it. You know, what's really funny is that I became certified in the mid 70s in acupuncture, and that's when my criticism started. Mm -hmm. Goldstein used to be a good vet, but now he's sticking needles in animals. Now, I think it's 30, like 20, 26 of the 33 veterinary schools in the United States in some way support, train, or use acupuncture. And my colleagues that were criticizing me so much in the 70s and 80s for this stuff are now certified in acupuncture. And when I go to continuing education classes, they say to me, God, you were so far ahead of your time. <laughs> and I say to them, acupuncture has been around three or 4,000 years. I'm not ahead of my time. I'm just 30 years less behind than you are. <laughs> Wake up. You're just reaching back. Yeah, it's just, give me a break. I'm going to bring Allison V on. I'm going to unmute. Allison Van Ness? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Just like old home week. <laughs> Allison, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, thanks. So. Uh, oh, my God, Allison. How are you? <laughs> good. How are you? <laughs> um, so I'm talking about Norman, Norman. the cat. Yeah. Norman the cat. Yeah, so he had, uh, you saw him, he had a, an injury to his tail that didn't change for a couple of years. And then he re-injured it a few months ago and now there's a big bulb on it and they want to amputate. And um, I'm really torn. I think part of it is because, you know, the cancer they think might happen or pain, but he seems fine to me. It's definitely different. And my gut is to just kind of let it go, let it, but I do, I'm really doing Yeah, I mean, you, you have to play that. The, the time you do surgery, surgery never cures cancer, period. Because if surgery cured cancer, where'd the first cancer cell come from? A lack of surgery? And that's where we were talking before, early detection. You know, and now, there was this whole, there's always been this concept of wide margins, which is finally, even though I've been against the concept of wide margins for most of my career, and all surgeons would try to get wide margins. A patient that doesn't have cancer is a wide margin. So when you remove a tumor and you get wide margins, where did the first cancer cell come from? The Bronx <laughs> or the garage. So the only time you remove a tumor is not to protect yourself from the fear of cancer spreading in the body. It's if it's impinging on the immune system and functions of life. If I have a dog that has a tumor that's pressing on its intestine and it can't utilize the food it's eating, if you don't get that tumor out, it's going to die. But if I have a dog that has a tumor on its side, I've had dogs with cancer six, seven, eight years, and we never cured the dog, but it had a great life. So if that tumor of the tail is bothering him or starting to grow rapidly, meaning that it's been there for a long time, but now his immune system, because he's older, can handle it that well, then yes, Take it off because the tail is not that important to life. It's not like you're amputating a leg. So, but you got to play it by Norman. Yeah. Definitely. What about his cough? Uh, your product changed everything. That, um, sh what is it? Shine and Luster. Shine and Luster? Yeah. It's gone. I, I give him more when there's more pollen, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what? Though the supplements in there are very immune supportive. Yeah. I got a question for the whole group and you, Jane. Okay. What is the number one stimulus to a cancer patient with a tumor? When you say the number one stimulus to the cancer? To the immune system. To the immune system. Hmm. Do tell us. The tumor. Oh, of course. What's the number one stimulus when you get, if you get 
exposed to a bacteria or a virus, like it's strep throat, where you get the flu, how do you get better? Those organisms stimulated the production of antibodies to fight the organism. The genius I worked with way back in the 80s, Lawrence Burton, proved that there's a tumor antibody system in the body. Right. So a tumor is constantly stimulating the, the, the immune system to, to produce antibodies. This is why, and I wrote this in my book recently, you'll hear the old story of a person that has a little tumor on her arm. And it's growing a little and growing. And two years later, she says, you know, I'm going to have it removed. And two months later, she dies of systemic cancer. That's because the tumor on the arm was stimulating the production of antibodies that was keeping other tumor cells in the body in check. You suddenly remove the tumor, no more stimulus of antibodies, the other cells overwhelm the body. So if you keep on working on Norm's, Norm's immune system, Allison, with good supplements, maybe add in some anti-cancer supplements like mushroom supplements, that tumor is going to stimulate antibodies. So I have seen many, many times over a cancer patient's life where they'll grow a tumor over uh, six months, eight months, and then all of a sudden it'll stop growing and all of a sudden it'll start to shrink. So what's the most, Jane, what's the most predictable thing about cancer? The most predictable thing about cancer is um, that it stimulates the body's immune system. Nope. Okay. Why do so many people die? If cancer stimulates the body's immune system, why do so many people die? Um, it overwhelms the body's immune That's system. That's right. The most predictable thing about cancer is it's 100% unpredictable it's a condition created by man to now be smarter than man so we can't use the last four tail tumors to tell you what norman's going to do so we have to watch norman as norman and it's a day-by-day -day thing our goal with norman is for him to live the rest of his life with that stupid lump on his tail. But if it starts to get his life down, starts to grow, gets in the way of him enjoying life, amputate. A tail amputation is not a huge job. Thank you. Sounds like a good question answered. Um, How did you find this website? How did you know I was on? I follow on Instagram on Dog Doc. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to bring on, this is Betsy Weathers. Betsy, I've unmuted you. Can we go ahead, can you go ahead and ask a question? Can we hear you? Hmm. Okay. Maybe. Betsy! Betsy, are you with us? So Betsy dropped a question in here, and it's maybe her, um, Microphone isn't working. Let's see. She has five feral cats that she's trying to get to be inside cats. Um, and she doesn't want to give them prescribed meds that have cancer effects. Did you, Betsy, maybe you can, I don't know what the prescribed meds were for the feral cats, or is it flea medicine or? Um, yeah, that, don't do it. Flea and tick medicine. Um, and so she's wondering if there are any things you, anything you can recommend to uh, help Amelia. She's in, um, I think she's in Georgia. Anything that kind of oils or something that's non-toxic that she can use regarding flea? Oh, yeah, there's so many. I mean, that's the one thing about Google right now is so good because it gives you a reference. There are, there are, when I graduated and I started being a holistic vet, there was one supplement in the United States for animals. Do you know how many supplements there are for animals and products right now? A zillion. So one thing you could do is uh, hook yourself up with an integrative veterinarian. There are some awesome ones in Georgia. 
There were some of the original holistic veterinarians. Michelle Tillman spent, it's Tiggleman, T-I-L-G-H-M-A-N, is an incredible veterinarian. Cats are supposedly very sensitive to essential oils, but I've still seen herbal sprays work incredibly well in combating fleas and ticks on dogs and cats. And I would start there, you know, instead of using the animal's body as a vehicle to transport an immunosuppressive drug to kill a critter in the environment. So I, I agree with you, but you should start your search right now instead of just going along with the conventional vet's opinion, oh, start on these chemicals. That's why we got in trouble. All right, great, thank you. Um, and I dropped, you said it was Michelle Tiggleman, T-I-G-L-E. Yeah, well, it's, Till, it's Tillman, but when oh. you spell it, it has a G in it. Okay, um, I dropped her name into the chat. And also, um, I'm gonna drop this in one more time so everyone can, even if you came on late, um, this has the link to, oops, let's see. I didn't send that to you. AHVMA? Everyone. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, and also to, let's see, whoops. All right, that's, yeah, there we go. Um, so there's the link to the dog doc. There's a link to Smith Ridge. There's a link to the AHVMA.org. Um, yeah, the other link you should put in there okay. is drmartypets.com. Okay. Because the supplement that Norman, Allison's cat, took, it's a supplement I created based on all my anti-allergy immune supportive supplements for dogs called Shine and Luster. Okay. And I had a sample bot bottle and it wasn't approved for cats, and Norman is a cat. And I gave it to Allison, and I said, listen, this is not FDA approved right now for cats, but I've been using the same supplements in cats for almost 40 years. And Norman had a chronic cough. I'm talking years and years. And we were successful with certain herbs. We were successful with antibiotic therapy. And then, like she just told me, I gave her this supplement for dogs, and after seven or eight years, it blew the cough out. So DrMartyPets.com has all the products, foods, and supplements that I've created based on my almost 50 years of experience. Yay, um, yay for Norman, huh? Oh, yeah, Norman's a trip. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know, his name is Norman, so you got to expect something. <laughs> yeah, Norman. All right, great. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have um, a question? Scarlett, it's hard to imagine that you don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Scarlett always has a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, Scarlett, but I just wondered if you have anything you want to ask Dr. Marty? I'm going to unmute you. There you are. Hey, Scarlett. Uh, there you All go. Right. There we go. Yeah. All right. So. Um, Biggie had cancer. Uh, he had a tumor removed uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. And uh, so is yeah, on your website is there are, you know, I, I've tried to, people say like feed raw, don't feed raw, et cetera. Um, I don't know, I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't know what to give, like what I would like to do is, one, I'm gonna search for like a, a veterinarian. Which is yep. What you do, but um, would they be able to help me with, I guess, the food, or is it something? Oh, a absolutely. Right. Even though it all starts with food, and diet is so important, my work became so successful based on the use of supplements, because we've adulterated the food chain for so many generations and decades that if you took a car that was out of tune and you wanted to run really well and you bought the best gasoline in the world, it's not gonna run well until you have a mechanic tune it up. Okay. So 
even if you fed Biggie the, the best food in the world, if the pancreas is not working well and producing enzymes, or the liver that has a thousand functions is not working well, that food's not gonna be utilized properly. So this is where working with an integrative veterinarian with specific supplements, not just diet, is so important. And because every snowflake is different, every dog is different. So if you read something on the internet on a similar cancer type, it may not apply in this case. That's why working with a veterinarian is so important because they'll take blood samples and they'll work with the patient as their patient, not as a statistic on the internet. Okay. And, and do you, um, in, your, in all your years of, of practice, have you seen a correlation between um, spaying or neutering early and problems later? And the only reason I bring that up is I'm just liking it to humans. If like a, a small child, you know, you don't have hormones produced or you give a small child like a hysterectomy or something, you know, where it's gonna, they're not gonna have the, um, would it create things later? Yes, 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 yes. When I had my own show with Martha Stewart for six years, I had a Dr. Christine Zink, Z-I-N-K. She graduated vet school in Canada she came down and became an MD at Johns Hopkins, and she specialized in sports injuries for animals. And she spent her entire career documenting the adverse effects of early spay and neuter on dogs and cats. And that was established by the veterinary school, UC Davis. If you go online and put in UC Davis, early spay and neuter, you'll see the entire study on how spaying dogs before the age of one leads to or enhances a whole bunch of horrible conditions in the cancer field, in the joint field, in the behavior field. So yes, yes, yes. We do not want to do early spaying and neutering if we can help it. You know, because it's a, uh, it's, you know, you have all like, you know, rescues and spay and neuter programs and, and, and all that. And part of that, I mean, I think is just irresponsible ownership, right? If you have an intact dog, you are to just keep them. If you don't want to have puppies, you don't have male and female together, you separate it, those kinds of things where, you know, you're trying to control a population, but yep. at the same time, like what you're doing to them. And again, I mean, you know, I've tried to, like biggest set, uh, sedentary, <laughs> he's little, you know. Like he is. He's like a. He's like a rock. He's. He's so muscular, and that's really just genetics, really. Oh yeah. You know, and you know, I think about like. Uh, I mean, I I rescued him, and he had already been neutered. But I wonder what he would have been like if he had not. I mean, he would. Have just yeah, been, I mean, it, it, you know? I don't think it causes cancer, because these animals that are early spayed and neutered are also living on horrible pet food, getting vaccinated every year, living on heartworm preventative flea control products, which are blowing out the immune system. But it's another factor that is immune suppressive, spaying and neutering at a very early age, removing their hormones, even though there is justification for early spay and neuter, like you said, with the overpopulation, once again, it's an integrative approach to wellness, common sense, and health. Oh, so there is, you can have heartworm, because when I got him, he was heartworm positive. It was very high positive, and so we went through the treatment. And so th is there actually like holistic, like non-medicine or chemical? Yeah, I've seen. Heartworm, like he's taking his heartworm pill. Yeah, I've seen, it depends where pill. in the country, but I've seen where, where I practice, I've seen two cases of heartworm in the last eight years. And they both came to me eight years ago. One was a dog from Mississippi, and the other was a dog from Southern Texas. They came to me, heartworm positive. We put them both on herbal programs, mm. 
and they're hot or negative today. The dog from Southern Texas is owned by the guy that they mistakenly gave the Academy Award to for La La Land. <laughs> and his father-in-law called me today. Her name, the dog's name is Gertie. She had heartworm. And that was nine years ago, and she's still doing fine. So we put Gertie on an herbal program having heartworm, and she reverted back to negative. So depending where you live, you could actually use herbs instead of chemical heartworm preventative. But, you know, once again, that's where I recommend, you know, down in Georgia, you probably have a ton of heartworm. That's where I would recommend consulting with an integrative veterinarian on the truth about heartworm and how to properly prevent it where you live. All right, thank you. Yeah, because I have a cat too and she has a heart condition. She's taking two medications and, you know, I, I struggle. <laughs> you know, she's taking enalapril and ferrosamide and, and, uh, and then she just had blood work done and I did not know this, but I guess apparently, you know, when they did the blood work, there's some new test that they're saying can predict with some like 90% certainty. So the doctor said, you know, in two years, it's like the 96% chance that she's going to have renal failure because there are certain markers. Yeah, stuff. that's all jabber. Talk to the gelatis okay. when Dexter and, and, had a month to live and lived till 17. And all I did, you know, I, it just, my heart sunk. And I, you know, after I hung up, I just like cried for like an hour. And then I was like, all right, I need a plan because she yeah. doesn't have it. I mean, yeah, no, no, work with the. You're going to die, right? No. We're all born, we're all going to die, right? So. When you, when you got specific supplements for a condition, you minimize the effect of the drugs. So many people and so many animals that die do not die of the disease, they die of the therapy for the disease. Mm -hmm. If you were to take a cancer patient and on chemotherapy for cancer, they would probably die not having cancer. So we start to work on health for a heart patient with supplements. You'll minimize the amount of drugs, and that's probably what's going to save. And that's probably what's going to go against the book of statistics, because Dexter had a month to live and lived 900 years. Now that's a long lived. <laughs> oh no, Dexter was a trip. I'm telling you, of all the cases, and I've, oh yeah, I mean, I must have worked on hundreds of thousands of cases in my career. He's definitely up there in the top 10. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> he was outstanding. Yeah, he was the ever ready battery times three. Yeah, he said he lived to be 17. <laughs> yeah. And he had a, a month to live. Years. years and years before. Yeah. It's kept on ticking. It's hard work with vacation and believing and connecting. And Dr. Maori, you always gave us hope. Hope. Yeah, hope. I just wrote the section of hope in my book. Hope precedes healing. What I wrote in the book. Heaven. Every time we went there. <laughs> hope, heaven, and healing. The three H's. <laughs> awesome. Well, yay, Dexter, huh? Oh, yeah. We even use Dr. Marty's book for ourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it looks like we've answered all the questions. Um, I want to say Alex and Debbie, Deborah, is that right? Deborah, it's really nice to meet you. Allison, thank you for coming Hello. on. Yes. Hello, yeah. Norman. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, there's Norman. <clears throat> Very good. And um, I do these conversations. I just started them several months ago, but every Wednesday I have a different guest on. And <clears throat> what's really nice is the really intimate format, you know, that we can ask questions and, and have an opportunity to visit with one another. Um, I started this series when COVID hit because it was isolating. 
So um, I want to thank everybody for coming by. Thank you so much, Dr. Watch the film. You really, if you didn't, if you didn't see this film, not because that has anything to do with me, it's just a trip. The veterinary establishment needs to watch this film. I would say Period. it's very, it's beautifully made. It's really heartwarming. It's a great story and has a lot of great information in it. So um, I just want to say thank you again for everyone for stopping by. And you can follow us on Instagram. We're at Wagworthy Naturals. Um, and we have guests on every week. We talk about health or wellness or rescue or, you know, um, therapy dogs. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Marty. I really appreciate you joining us. And we'll look Yeah, out, it was a pleasure. We'll look out for your book, um, your new book. Um, and tell me again the title, because I'm going to drop that in the chat. The Spirit of Animal Healing. OK. <clears throat> and I will stay on for a minute here so that um, if any, you know, just to make sure that everyone has a chance to um, grab the links off of the chat. Um, so I'll leave the, you know, I'll leave the Zoom up for just a minute so everybody can be sure to grab these links. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Dr. Marty. I wish you the best on this next stage in yeah. your journey. It's exciting. Um, for those of you maybe that came on late, Dr. Marty is, um, his practice lives on, but he's moved on to doing more writing and research and teaching. Um, and so we wish you all the best. Thanks. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, Jelani's. Bye. Love you. Always Bye. in the house. Always. Bye.